Thank you so much, Bridget, and thank you, a Public Space, for hosting this. I got really excited to see on the chat box people coming from all over the world. I, when I started thinking about this, I, I am a simplicist and I'm a realist. So my rationale is I've always found comfort in reading Tolstoy. And I think there might be five people in the world who would do it with me and who would find the comfort. And I'm very excited and overwhelmed with gratitude that so many people join us. I want to just say a few things before we go to answer people's questions. One is, and the people commented on the pacing, the good pacing of 15 pages a day. So I'm a late, I, I was actually, I was a late uh, comer to, to War and Peace, but I started Tolstoy early. When I was nine, the, the, later, uh, the later novel by Tolstoy, Resurrection, was translated into Chinese and was serialized, serialized in a Beijing evening newspaper. And I made sure every night I got the newspaper before everybody else in my family did, and I would read the section. But you only got so much in a day. You always have to wait for the next day, no matter how hungry you are, how eager you, you feel. And I think that, and a lot of books early on I read were serialized in newspapers. And that taught me the most important thing was patience. Patience and time, as Kutuzov said, you know, patience and time are my mighty warriors. So, so what I, when we started and we thought 15 pages, I have to make a confession. This is actually the fastest reading I have done with War and Peace. Usually I take six months to read. So that only just involves 15 minutes in the morning when I drink coffee. And this time we did in 85 days. I did another time I taught the novel in 11 weeks. So it was about the same time as the same stretch of time, except I met my students once a week and they read 100 pages, uh, uh, about 100 pages a week. And I realized that was different from my experience this time. I think the experience this time was really an eye-opening experience for myself was we just read 15 pages and we just talk about those 15 pages and there's no pressure. There's no looking forward or looking back. Sometimes we did look back. So, so that's the pacing and I, I think, you know, maybe some of you read Alexandra Schwartz's um, uh, piece in The New Yorker this week, and she called it decanting the novel, and I really like that metaphor. And so I want to just say a few things about why reading Tolstoy or why reading War and Peace. The, the, the translation I read, the PV translation, came out in 2007, and Ever since then, I've been reading it once a year. I usually read in the beginning of the year, so from January to June. So this time I started late because the beginning of the year was really chaotic, but I actually finished earlier than usual. And so the, I think someone asked, you know, at the beginning I said this novel provides solidity and a structure to life. Then that was my experience from my so many years of reading. And part of it, I think it was just a number of pages a day. And you know, you will get there. There's no hurry. There's no reason to be impatient. And there, there were a couple moments in my life I had a very difficult time in my life and and there was a time that I couldn't even read War and Peace. I could maybe read one page or two pages. And so the other thing I did was I would hand copy the passages from the novel onto index cards if I could not read. I, I was reading, actually when we were reading this, I was also reading Anna Karenina. And there was a moment when Levin was very upset and he was so upset. And then he went into his room and he, he picked up a dumbbell and he started to, you know, to exercise. And after that, he felt much better. 
So I think that's exactly what I did when I couldn't read. I would just hand copy the passages it's just to keep the mind and keep the hands moving. Anything achievable is good for life. And at the beginning of pandemic, I was talking to a friend. She said, I said something, I said, I said, you know, my goal is to just to do anything achievable. And she said, and then anything achievable is good good thing for a pandemic. And I think it's also a good thing for life. And of course, my anything achievable always includes uh, Tolstoy, always includes War and Peace. So we're going to ask, uh, we're going to answer a few questions, but I want to just talk about, I am a reader of this novel and I don't think of myself as an expert on Russian literature. I'm not an expert on Tolstoy and I'm not an expert on history. In fact, I always say I am a perennial amateur reader of this novel. So the way I look at my reading this novel, where I look at this novel is, you know, I have a, I have a strong belief that a reader and a writer should never meet in the world. So if I am working on a book, my entire relationship is with my book, with my characters. And once I finish my book, I sever my relationship with my book and my book goes out to meet the readers. And some readers love it. Some readers hate it. Some readers feel indifferent, but that's an entire relationship between the book and the readers. So I always look at it as a triangle, you know, the reader, writer and book. And the triangle looks exactly like the triangle, you know, among Natasha, Andre and Pierre. So when Natasha and Andre were developing a relationship, I think Pierre's instinct is just to withdraw, to, to be absent. And that's a, my writer's instinct too. And because of that belief, I also hold on to the belief that when I read a book, it's my contract not to have a relationship with the writer. So I am reading Tolstoy's work. I'm not reading Tolstoy, the person. So that distinction is important to me. And let me see if I have anything else. I think that's all I have just for beginning. And I think uh, Bridget has questions from the audience that we can start. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I thought we'd start with a question that takes us back to the very beginning of the book and one of your very first posts. Um, it's a question that Murray Silverstein asked and he started with, with your quote, so I'll just read it. Um, in times like these, you wrote, one does want to read an author who is so deeply moved by the world that he could appear unmoved in his writing. And Murray Silverstein said, I found this so intriguing and mysterious. This is not so much a question as a wish to have you expand on this desire. I think I understand so deeply moved but could you say more about the second half of the equation, that he could appear unmoved in his writing? Another way to say this, perhaps, I'd like to hear more about your experience of stability and solidity in the novel and how that quality can be understood as a result of Tolstoy's deep engagement in and with the world. Yes, thank you. That's, a, that's such a great question. I feel, you know, I feel that I can, well, I feel I need to write it like 5,000 words essay about that. But just to answer briefly. So there is this writer, there's, I always call him second rate writer. And Maxim Gorky, who was a Soviet writer, but who was also, you know, who met and studied with or followed Tolstoy at the beginning of his career. I, I do not like Gorky's work, but I, do really love Gorky's uh, words on Tolstoy. He said of Tolstoy, in his eyes, Tolstoy had a hundred eyes. And that's how I feel about reading any of Tolstoy's um, work is he sees with many eyes. He's one of the most democratic seer in the world. And he sees it as we see, as we read in War and Peace, 
He sees the animals and the children and the soldiers and the officers and the society ladies, society ladies at an equal distance. And he writes about them as though they are all equal. And that to me is, is a kind of, because he's so engaged with every Buddy, every character, including animal, he's writing about. He's actually removing himself, and we as readers see what Tolstoy sees. And but I always feel that I only have one pair of eyes, even though I've read this book for many times. Every reading is still to catch up with him, to see something that he sees that I have missed in the last reading. And, and one more thing, yes, yeah, so I said, you know, he's equally removed from the characters. One thing I, I find interesting is Tolstoy never lets us know whose side he's taking about a character. I'm not talking about French army, you know, he, he did take side when he writes about Russian army, he says, us, we, but he, uh, he does not let us know how he feels about many of his important characters. For instance, Andre, he writes Andre with both tenderness and this sharp dissection and with Pierre and Natasha and all these major characters. So I like that he doesn't let us in on which side he is on or what he's thinking about these characters. He just lets us see them. That answers the question. That's, I'm sorry. I'm s After this pandemic, if I can still speak English, I'm very happy. Um, we had a, a number of questions about how the novel changed for you with each reading. And I think you said that you have read it at least a dozen times. Um, Mark Lewis wondered about the circumstances around the very first time you read War and Peace and how much time passed before you read it. Um, Annie Leontis wondered, what have you discovered recently in your later readings that you may not have caught the first or second time through? And another person asked, do you know War and Peace so well? I wonder if this shared reading brought anything new to you. And if I can, yeah. I just wanna add um, a question that came in through the question box. Um, Wayne Scott uh, asked if we were using Twitter correctly or should we have been doing less individual tweeting and more commenting on a few central tweets? And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how how you read the conversation that took place after your daily posts every morning. Yes. Okay, so there are several questions. I think, you know, I, t I talk about my first reading was when the translation came out. It, you know, I, I think one always needs some either motivation or just some pushing to read a book like that. And and many of the first readers said, you know, the pandemic makes it make it happen. And for me, it's just a new translation came out. I must read it. So that was my first motivation. You know, in my first few readings, I think I probably like everybody else. I paid a lot of attention to the plot. Really, there's no plot in War and Peace. It's just time, time moving. I paid a lot of attention to time, to the stories, to characters, and as I read on, um, I think there were a few years I paid more attention to how Tolstoy did it, how he could write 600 characters without getting lost and, and without getting us lost. And how, how, he, how he writes about time when there are so many different threads in the novel. So I, I think there were maybe three or four years when I read, I mostly read from the craft's point of view and I did give several lectures using the novel as an example of, for novel writing. But later I think I'm coming back to read it. You know, I don't think I, I mean, I learned a lot from reading the novel, but I really, the most enjoyable reading is to read it as just a reader. And I think in my recent readings, I paid more attention to one is things I've missed before. Two is the minor characters. A lot of, like some of the minor characters appeared one line in the book 
for instance, that when, when Nikolai came back from the war, you know, he entered a house, he saw the doorman who was plating the shoes, but the, the description was he was able to, he was able to lift a carriage, and but he was also plating the shoes. And so that detail actually, I missed that all these years of reading. And when I, when I read it this time, I caught it and I thought that's such a good one line character. And you could almost feel and see this big man, but you know, patiently pleading the, sh the shoes. And parents, parenthood, I, I think, again, I think I, when I was reading it, I was, well, when I first started, I was a young mother of young children, but now I'm an older mother of like a little bit older children. So my, so my impression or my feeling about it, the mothers also changed, especially Boris's mother and Natasha's mother. So I did miss in my all these years of my reading because, because the final, you know, when Petia died, it was such a big moment in the novel. So I always remember Countess as the mother of that one lost child. And this reading, I realized she, at the beginning of the novel, it says she had 12 children. She gave birth to 12 children and she lost eight of them. She only had four left when the novel started. So it gave me a new angle or I don't know, new perspective of looking at her as a mother because a lot of times in the, in the novel, she wasn't, the, she was, she is not the, the most sympathetic character. And Boris's mother too, you know, she's calculating, she's scheming, she's doing all these things. But then one, I think at one moment she said, I think she said to Natasha's mother, she said, you know, all the things you want to do for your son. And I was quite touched this time when I was reading that. So I think it's just, when you read a book for so long, your relationship, you also go through life and your, your relationship with the book actually changes because your life changes. So that's how I feel. And well, yeah, so what else did I notice this time? I think there was something I really liked. Let me, let me think. Oh yes. So there was that one time when this was the beginning of the novel when Princess Maya went to the old prince uh, study to, to do the math, to do geometry, and she didn't do it right. And he, he was really grumpy. He was really angry with her. And he said something really nasty. But then he touched her hair and said, you're a fool. And it's just that moment I think he touched her hair and said you're a fool that actually reminds me of King Lear when Cordelia died King Lear came in with Cordelia in his arms and then he says he said my poor my poor foolish hand and all these years I never made that connection but this reading I made I sort of just I thought about the two old men and the two daughters and the two father's daughter relationships so there are a lot of like every reading is a new experience. Every reading I learned something new. I'm really worthy today. Can I can I ask you just as a follow up what the experience of reading it with so many people this time? How oh yes, that's right. I forgot that. I was surprised and overwhelmed with I mean it's just it's just different. I would say, you know, when my children were young and once I think I was criticized by their teachers, one of the kindergarten teachers said to me and said, you know, I know he, he can't read, but in this country, we believe in parents reading to the children and you're not reading to your children. And I was baffled at the time because when I grew up, I grew up with, I mean, it's just in a crowded place. There was no private space. The only time you could go away from the world, the only time you could go away from people was to open a book. So for me, reading is always the most private and most important solitary activity. So I never, I probably, I, I, I did not understand book club until this time. And certainly this is a probably not a, traditional conventional book club 
but it's just reading with so many people. One is to know so many people are reading the same pages on the same day. I, I think that that does give a feeling of being with people, especially at the beginning, we were all in lockdown. It gives a nice feeling of being with others in a way. And, and the other thing, I learned so much through this reading, just through reading people's tweets. Because I, I said yesterday, I said, we're all like bees. We all go out to forage and we all bring things back. And all those visuals, maps, you know, pictures and paintings, those were the things that I would never have got if I was, if I was not reading with this group of people. So, so I, I think I really enjoyed I just reading people's posts. And that's the other thing. I, I'm not on social media only because I'm always thinking social media is such a mean place. It feels to me that this is one time that this is a group of people who are actually doing something together to support each other and to learn from each other and to entertain each other. That also changes maybe my view of social media just a little. I think, did I answer the question? I feel that it, yeah. Oh, you Seriously. said, should we, okay, you did say, should we all, I, did you say like, should we all comment on central like themes or this same? I think there was a question about, about were, were there, how was one supposed to engage on Twitter? And I think the answer is exactly as everyone did. Um, I think that was the spirit. That's what made this such an extraordinary experience. Thank you so much, Bridget, you said so well. So that's exactly how I feel. Um, there were a number of questions about um, favorite characters. And I see that there's been some chit chat on the sidebar about that as well. I think at one point early on, um, I think in maybe week three or four, we sort of divided into Camp Andre and Camp Pierre. Um, and I just wanted to, there were a couple of questions in particular about your favorite characters. Um, Catherine Fitch said, I've been puzzling about Pierre for three readings of this book over 30 years, happily puzzling. I'd love to hear your understanding of your favorite character. Oh yes, I love Pierre. I, th <laughs> I think part of Pierre is a bumblebee and I have a soft spot for people or characters who are bumblebees. And I probably feel like a bumblebee myself too. But earlier in the novel, this is the, towards the beginning of the party, and there was one sentence. It's Tolstoy repeated once in the, so he said it twice in the, the same chapter. He said Pierre was feeling awkward, but not embarrassed. I, you know, again, I read it so many times. I think sometimes when Tolstoy repeats something, I noticed and I have thoughts and I, but this time I missed that. And actually it's Bridget who asked me and Bridget said, what does it mean for Pierre to feel awkward, but not embarrassed? And all of a sudden, okay, I, I don't like all of a sudden, the word all of a sudden, the phrase all of a sudden, but all of a sudden I feel that I understand Pierre. I think, you know, when we talk about someone feeling awkward, it's about some sort of lacking. It's like a lacking social skills or physical skills. And Pierre is awkward in so many ways. You know, he cannot enter a salon well, and he cannot leave a salon well. So, so he's, he's, he is awkward. But embarrassment, I feel it has a different meaning. I think embarrassment is one, so awkward is a re, one's relationship with the world. You know, we only feel awkward when we are with someone. So if I'm humming a song by myself, even if I'm not a good singer, I'm not a good singer, I don't feel awkward. But if someone else hears me, then I would feel awkward. So awkward to me always indicates a relationship with others and a relationship with others' expectations and judgments. 
But embarrassment is more about one's feeling about oneself. It's really, to me, it indicates a relationship with oneself. So there's some sort of standard within oneself one does not meet, and that's when one feels embarrassed. So that's when I sort of I thought about this embarrassing or awkward or feeling embarrassed awkward for a long time and I realized Pierre is the kind of character who actually struggles with the you know with the world he is always trying to find a place to for himself in the world but I think he doesn't have that embarrassment in front of himself he knows exactly what he wants and but he doesn't know how to get it so that's why he has all these pursuits you know freemason religion you know numer numerical what do you call that the letter the, the numbers so he has all these ways but i don't think he's embarrassed because he knows deep inside him he knows who he is and that's why i really like him and the other thing i like about him is his uncertainty so a while ago i was giving a reading and someone asked me a question said you know what what a what does a writer need you know as a qualification i said i didn't think when i said curiosity i think that's that's probably an okay answer but that's such a you know i feel it's such an easy answer you can always see you want to be curious and this man was persistent. He said, but, but what do you mean curiosity? I don't understand. And so I realized I actually spoke too lightly. So I took that answer back and I thought for a moment, I thought actually I think a writer needs or a person needs this uncertainty. And I value uncertainty. And Pierre is uncertain about so many things. But I think the whole novel, it's, he is going from being uncertain to finally being certain about something. So I think after he was released from the, the camp, the, the POW camp, he said, he said, I think I have notes somewhere. He said, there's a limit to suffering and a limit to freedom and that those limits are very close. And I think, and then he compares, you know, he goes on to compare different kinds of suffering. And I think he has gone a long way from uncertainty to some certainty to get some clarity. And that to me is, you know, there's no shortcut to clarity. I feel like he has walked a thousand miles there. He hasn't, I mean, I think characters, some characters do have epiphanies. And Andre has a lot of epiphanies. Epiphan epiphanies to me feels like epiphanies feels like when children in video games said, "I teleport here, I teleport there." It's a faster way to get there. And I like I like Pierre because he has to walk a thousand miles, and I think I have always been walking with him. So, but I want to say, you know, Andre is I miss. I might have misread Andre all these years until this reading. And when I started to read people's comments about Andre, and especially, you know, with some of the really good readers talking about Andre, I realized I I probably need to go back to just to read about him. I always think of him as sort of an arrogant, a little bit, you know, self-centered man. But someone mentioned that to me that he's a sensitive man. I have never, I, I must say, I have never thought about his being a sensitive man. So I think that's one thing I learned from this reading. And I want to go back to look at Andre again. Um, someone asked which character has grown most in stature, given the fact that you've read War and Peace every year for a number of years. Right. Well, the minor characters, I think, for instance, I think Burke really actually, I started, you know, Burke is such a silly man, but I, I've i become really fond of Burke because he's so limited and he also acts 
fully and feels fully and thinks fully within his limitation. And I thought that's, you know, that reminds me of this Marianne Moore's quote. And she said, if someone is just a six pence ball and he's being a very nice six pence ball, what's wrong with that? So I feel like Berg is really living to the full limit or full potential of his limit. So I wouldn't say he gained status, but I, I really have become more fond of him. And Vera too, you know, another not very sympathetic character. It feels like she's a changeling in this family, in the Rostov family. Nobody likes her, nobody, you know, is nice to her. And I think she probably deserves a novel on the side. Mademoiselle Bohien is another character. I'm always fascinated by her. And the more I read, the more I like her. You know, remember she won when she when she when she dreamed about her Russian prince. He says the Russian prince will come and get her, and then her poor mother will show up. I always, when I read that, I always feel very touched by her orphan's dream. I think she also deserves a entire an entire novel. So I think a lot of minor characters have gained weight in my continuous reading. Um. Someone is asking about Napoleon. Why does Tolstoy de despise him so much? And I thought by way of um, maybe answering that question, we might play a clip that you shared with us of a conversation that you had with Joyce Carol Oates about War and Peace. Tolstoy is very good, I think, in, in envisioning the life of nations and the, the, what he calls history, the idea of history, in contrast to the, in the foreground, you have people, people living their lives in, in a series of episodes, as he calls them. And I think that he also believed in something sort of like, like contingency or accident or some obscure law of history that's almost independent of human will. And we find ourselves in situations like that all the time. Well, I think like any great thinker, he contradicted himself quite a bit too. And I felt that in, in giving voice to Napoleon, that he was trying to confront some of his own uh, personality features that he did not really admire. I mean, I think Tolstoy was himself, an extreme narcissist, an ego maniac, along with being a great artist. And so he was particularly sensitive to seeing those traits in other people. And that's his fascination with Napoleon really makes the novel. He would probably not, he might not have written a novel without Napoleon as this, this right. nemesis. Right. You know, I remember you said something about obsession. You know, you have to have obsession to write an album. You certainly do. You certainly do. Yes, that's so true. It's quite an interesting phenomenon, really. So you have to have an, emotion, an emotional engagement with the text. Also, I think to really love art, you have to be vulnerable to it at certain times in your life. So, yes. So I, I had, I had, a, you know, it was a longer conversation with Joyce. Joyce always has a lot of good things to say, and I like what she said about, you know, conflict. I, I, you know, over the years, I, when I give lectures about Tolstoy, I think there, inevitably, there's the question people would ask: Why read Tolstoy? He's, I mean, I think the shortcut. The, the shortcut or the short version of the question was, he was such a horrible man. Why do we read him? And I don't think he was a horrible man. He, 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 was, he was, I mean, he certainly was a complex man and he had a lot of conflict within himself. But I, I think one thing I, I thought was interesting is he actually understood himself better than other people. So at the, at the end of his um, at the end of his life, he wrote a play called 
the light shines in the darkness. It's an autobiographical play. It's, it's the, the main character is like Tolstoy himself. You know, he wanted to do good things for the people. He, he wanted to give away all his wealth. His poor wife, this, you know, in the play, this poor wife was raising seven children for him. She was so exhausted. She was so tired. The kids are sick. You know, the older, older girls need to get married, but he doesn't, this man does not care. This man just wants to be good and pure and glorious. But the, the interesting thing about that play is he actually, the play was written with the family's need and the family's feeding in mind. So, so it's a play of self parody. And I think he really, in that play, he dissected himself or he probably just, I don't know, he just impaled himself more ruthlessly than he impaled many of the characters in War and Peace. So yes, I, I like that. I think, you know, Tolstoy certainly is a novel too. And I don't know who can. I mean, I, I can't imagine who can write Tolstoy, the novel, because you probably have to be Tolstoy to write that novel, so. Um, there are a number of questions that came in, um, and I thought I might just ask a couple of them. Uh, a number of people are asking about translation and if you have a favorite. And I guess I'm wondering, have you, every time you reread it, do you reread the same translation? Yeah, I, that's why I said, you know, I'm an amateur reader of Russian literature, and I'm an amateur reader of Tolstoy. I read. I mean, I just, I feel like I happen to have this translation. So I just read this translation. I saw, I cannot, I know there are different translations. I have been, well, I've been having a lot of fun just reading people's tweets about different translation. That purplish dog, that, you know, the lavender gray dog. It's so interesting to me, just different translators use different words. And, you know, do I worry about translation? that much probably not only because i'm not reading the russian original and i go to this masseuse who's from ukraine and i absolutely love her because every time i go to get my massage we talk about tolstoy and i think you know over the years she has been unimpressed with me because i haven't started reading i haven't started learning russian to read the original and According to her, you know, whatever translation I've been reading is not enough. So we have a couple of questions about point of view. Um, one person asked, on the topic of point of view and no central character, I wonder if you could speak about Tolstoy's ability to focus in and out, switching instantly from a cinematic moving view of a character back to a more omniscient view of the scene. And then somebody, I'll just ask a quick second question that relates. Um, a lot of advice to beginning novelists suggests that you pick a point of view character and stick with him or her throughout. Tolstoy gets into the heads of dozens, maybe hundreds of characters, including a horse and a wolf. How do you as a modern novelist see point of view? How do I? I feel that we modern writers, or not modern writers, I guess we at this moment were a bit intimidated or limiting ourselves to in, in many ways. You know, I was talking to Joyce and Joyce said, oh, you know, these 19th century novelists, they were not embarrassed and they were not timid. And I think that's the important thing. They're not embarrassed, you know, writing the most omniscient as omniscient as Tolstoy's omniscience. I, well, I myself believe in the freedom of writing in whatever point of view and in multiple point of view and the fluidity between omniscience and, you know, what do you call a close third person point of view. I think the, the reason is, you know, the reason we read literature versus we just watch War and Peace as a movie or on screen is, I think literature or books have the way to, you know, unfold the internal or the interiority, internal landscape of characters more than 
you know, images on the screen. So, so yes, of course, if you want to go to that internal landscape, the writer should have the confidence and authority to enter anyone's mind. I don't, I, I am baffled when people say omniscient point of view, omniscient narrator is not either popular or I, I, I think it has a lot to do with what people think you should be writing, how you should be writing. And well, anyone says that, you know, we should just not listen to them. Um, let me ask you a question about uh, history from Taylor Michael. When do we revisit history? I've been thinking about this in respect to Tolstoy revisiting the Napoleonic Wars and also in thinking about us as a society. That's such a good question, Taylor. You know, I, I feel that I have to form a good answer, although I probably can't. I'm, well, I was actually, I was talking to someone about British or English history, which I was very bad at. I, I said to this person, I mean, I just, everything I know about English history is through Shakespeare. And I know the history is off in Shakespeare and somehow but I still like to read history in his play. And I read War and Peace Party as a history book. And I think they're probably, you know, if you want to be comprehensive or even just have a multiple point of perspective, I think there, I probably should do a lot more reading. So, but that's why I think, you know, it's interesting. I. I think history is, is, maybe I should say this way, I, I guess the whole, the whole thing about Napoleon War, the history about Napoleon War, I learned from War and Peace, and there's really no way to say I know more than that. But I do think it's interesting about, you know, Taylor mentioned, you know, how do you understand, especially take, you know, considering where we are at this moment, how do you understand history? You know, when, when Trump was elected, I there was just all these terrible things happening. And I, I went back to read World War II, right before World War II, the, the history there. And you could see a lot of resemblance from, you know, back then and now. And so, for instance, in England, when the Nazi, the English Nazi Party and the English Communist Party, when the, the British Communist Party, when they both went into the street to protest, the police would not, the police would look away from the Nazi Party and would also only beat and, you know, the communist protesters. So I think that when I read that, I thought, well, that's, you know, exactly what's happening if you look at our world now. So, so it's, I think we live in history and there's, well, when we say we live in history, what do we mean? I think it's such a difficult way to say we live in history and, and look at this history. I think we can only record, you know, chronicle this, these moments and then coming back and look back from another point as we look back at World War II history. I'm sorry, Taylor, I'm not the articulate person to your question. You asked the best question. I'm, I feel like I'm fading you. <laughs> the inarticulate answers are always the good answers, the deepest answers. Um, a lot of people had questions about the epilogue. Yes, I epilogue. thought I might um, read a few of them. Uh, Amitabha Kumar wondered, he said, I'm interested in novels that are in between novels specifically those that mix essays with narrative fiction. In fact, I want to be an advocate for that kind of writing. Tolstoy does it in places, but the epilogue seemed to challenge my predilection for this kind of writing. Why this strain at the very end, when other, act, when other writers act as if they need to be hospitable to the reader and offer them a drink? <laughs> um, Patricia Clark was also curious about the epilogue, 
um, and asked what were the contemporary reviews of the book, including critiques of the epilogue. Um, and then defending the epilogue was Lawrence Coates, uh, who said, despite the general disapproval on Twitter of the second epilogue and Tolstoy's frequent declamations about history, I find them to be an integral part of the novel. And I can't conceive of writing a novel with a canvas so vast without a general theory of history. So perhaps one question is, could this novel stand without the omniscient narrator making declarations from time to time? Well, I know I made I made fun of the epilogue too because, you know, I I think my reading experience the epilogue is similar to a lot of people, but for myself I feel it, the novel absolutely needs the epilogue, and and partly I think that's what Tolstoy meant to do. You know, I I think Amitav Amitava has a point. You know, some writers are probably more hospitable and he probably will offer you a good drink at the end and pat you and say you have read 1200 pages you're great but that's not Tolstoy's goal I think Tolstoy wrote the, I mean my understanding certainly I think is probably not well-founded understanding I feel like Tolstoy wrote a book and to figure out a lot of things and to know a lot of things. And by the end, after he wrote this long novel, he felt that he figured out a few things in a right way or wrong way. But he figured out things and he must share them. And I think the risk of that epilogue is, you know, I, I, I actually, I reread the epilogue again today and I thought, you know, I really love a lot of things he said. I disagreed with other things he said. But I think the risk is he's almost preaching in the epilogue. You know, even if you are preaching the best message, I think the risk is you're cultivating resistance. And readers reading that epilogue will resist. I don't think I resist, but I sort of always wonder. My question is, he's persuading me. He's trying to convince me. Am I convinced by his epilogue? At different time of my reading or my life, in, in different readings, I have had different reactions. But he almost convinced me, I would say, because I realize sometimes I think about things. For instance, the pandemic, when the pandemic started, I, I do think about a lot of events with his historical view in mind, especially, you know, his long passages about necessity and freedom. I often think about those too. So yes, I think we should defend it and we should laugh at him for writing that epilogue. Could you talk a little bit about laughter and humor in the novel? Oh, yes. I, every time I read, I. I always think, oh, I forget how funny he is. It, uh, I mean, we always feel like Tolstoy is such a serious man, and he's, you know, all about the history and fate and all these things. But he has, he has his humor, you know, when he writes about Berg, when he writes about Vera, and when he writes about, you know, those officers in the army. I think he he's funny. The one thing I want to say is, you know, I think I always think of book as a friend or a book as a person, not all books are friends, but I always think of book as a person. So, so every time I read a book, I establish a relationship with the book, like with a person. So some books are acquaintances, you know, harmless, sometimes friendly, sometimes, you know, convenient, but they're acquaintances. Some books are really like strangers we only meet once in life and we'll never forget, even though we'll never go back to meet them. So I think there, those are the books we read at a, speci a spe specific time in our life, at a specific moment, and we're so affected we may not have to go back to read read them and some books are probably people you want to avoid at a party 
I know that sounds rude and judgmental, but I think some books you just have to run away from. Some books you remain indifferent to. I think War and Peace is a book like a close friend, at least it feels to me, because you can go to it with every mood. You know, I, I think if I feel funny, I, I want to laugh, I can go to the book. There are hilarious parts. If I feel mournful, there are a lot of mournful you know, chapters and moments in the, in the novel. And sometimes I want to feel profound and I go to the book to feel profound or I feel silly. I, I think a lot of books are for one mood or another mood. War and Peace to me is, it's a, it's a, it's a book for every mood in life. So that's all I can say. I think it is, a, it's a book I go to in every mood. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so I'll ask maybe just two. One is a quote that somebody sent, sent in a quote um, of Andres, who says they won't, he's speaking about something that he wants to say and, and chooses not to say. He says they won't understand. They can't understand that all those feelings they prize so, all our feelings, all those ideas that seem so important to us are unnecessary. We cannot understand one another. And he remained silent. Um, do you agree that that is all we need to understand one another, all our feelings, all those ideas, and that it's impossible to understand one another? I think, well, that's, I think that quote probably comes from right before Andre died and he was looking at Princess Maya and Natasha, and there's that moment that there are things he understands and they will not understand at that moment. I mean, how do I think about understanding? I think, I mean, I, well, again, this probably requires another 10,000 words essay, but my short answer is, I think we can know a person, we can know a person well, but understanding is probably, I would say it's hard to understand someone. I think it's, it's it, I think what we can do, maybe it just, I'm sorry, this is just my view and what I think what we can do is just to know a person, to know a person better, a little bit more, and that's all we can do for other people. You know, do we all, do, can we ever understand how another person feels? We can approximate understanding. We can never say we understand someone else. That's a very pessimistic view. I'm sorry. <laughs> but one continues to try. Um, maybe as a, as a final question for the evening, um, Annie Leonch has asked, what should we remember about Tolstoy? Oh, what do we remember? That's a, Annie, thank you for asking that question. I don't know Tolstoy well. I, <laughs> I actually, it's. I went to I went to Russia a few years ago, and I went to visit um, Yasnaya Polyana, his estate. So, I'm, I'm mostly I'm not. I don't usually visit a writer's, you know, museum because I like work. I like words better than the writer, but I don't think I should miss that opportunity. I didn't think I should miss that, miss that opportunity, so I went. So the the guard, the guide, the English guide was this young woman. She graduated from college and she lived in a village nearby from, you know, just two, 10 minutes from Yasnaya Poliana. And she graduated from college and she could not uh, find a job. So she applied to be an English guide at the museum. And what I really like was when she applied for the job, they asked her to study Tolstoy for six weeks by herself and to come up with her own script to introduce Tolstoy and work and the estate and everything, history. So she, she read all the Tolstoy's work. She read biographies. She, she did a lot of, I mean, it's just like six week independent study on Tolstoy. I think she probably, knows more than Tolstoy than a lot of people. So I really enjoyed the, the, the tour. 
And the thing she talked most about was Tolstoy failed almost at everything he tried to do. So he, she would lead me to a room and say, well, this is where Tolstoy wanted to start, it, to start a school to educate children. But, you know, in the end, he failed as an educator. And she would show these, you know, orchards and, and barns and said, you know, Tolstoy wanted to have a lot of agricultural revolution, you know, where new technology in agriculture. But in the end, he failed as, at agriculture. And then, you know, she talked about Tolstoy failed to come up with a religion for, you know, for humankind. So basically, I think my take home message was Tolstoy failed everything, but wrote a few good books. And that's how he was remembered. So maybe that's, maybe we can just think of him. You know, he, he is such a complex character. He had all these egomania. He was an egomaniac. He was. He did all these horrible things, but he failed a lot, a lot of things. But he wrote a few good novels, and that's how, that's how I like to know or remember him. Um, well, how lucky we are that War and Peace was one of them. Yes. Um, I want to thank you all again so much for joining us tonight, for sharing all of your insights and thoughts, um, and reading along with us for these past. 85 days. I, I really, really want to thank Ian, first of all, for suggesting it um, and for the consistency of it. Um, it's been such a joy and an honor for us to read with all of you. Um, I see it is um, sort of mentioned in the little chat section. Um, I hope you will join us when we launch a new series of book clubs. Uh, these will be shorter journeys. We'll be reading short novels starting in July when we'll be doing a book club with Garth Greenwell leading us through Henry James' Turn of the Screw. Um, again, you can find the archive of, of Tolstoy Together on our website and on Twitter. And I also want to mention a series of editorial masterclasses that our fellow Taylor Michael has been organizing that will be continuing throughout the year. So um, whether here or there, I hope we will all see you again and have ways to continue to read together. Um, be safe and uh, good night from New York. Thank you.